Good morning. It's good to be with you all this time on the Lord's Day as we've come to gather to worship in this sanctuary, this place that holds so much meaning to us. Um, and with all that represents this Lenten season of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. Um, I'm glad to see everybody here. I see that everybody turned their clocks back, although I did notice that Sunday school attendance was a little lower today. So, those of you who just arrived for Sunday school, it's time for worship. Um, and you can watch the back doors maybe 10 till noon and see who comes in at that time as well. So we'll, uh, we'll try not to laugh at that point, So right? Um, I do want to mention in terms of coming indoors that, as you have noticed today, our uh, accessible entrance off Martin Street is closed off for a few weeks. And we apologize uh, for those of you who made it harder for you to get in the building um, that entrance is going to be closed for about six weeks. So for those of you who need easier ways to enter into the building, uh, the best thing to do would be come in on the side door off the side parking lot. That's probably the best way. It's only a couple steps in, um, but we will not have wheelchair accessibility for about six weeks. So please keep that in mind in terms of family who are coming to worship with us um, and other friends you know who are coming at that time. All right, we got several things coming up. It's getting a busy time of the church year. So let me mention that deacons uh, will be having a short meeting um, in the chapel today um, at, after worship in the chapel. Uh, the Monday morning uh, monthly Bible study will be tomorrow in the ladies' parlor at their usual time at 10 a.m. And then afterwards, they'll be meeting at Papa Joe's 1115. And those of you who participate in First Baptist Church Sisterhood will also be joining them at Papa Joe's at 1115. Um, this Wednesday, we'll continue on uh, the Wednesday morning uh, reflective Lenten prayer week services at 9.30 a.m., which will be in the chapel at First Methodist. So uh, there were a couple of us from First Baptist there this past week, so maybe a couple more of you can join us at 9.30 on Wednesday morning. And then this coming Wednesday evening uh, will be our monthly fellowship meal. Uh, this will be a covered dish meal, so please bring some food that we can all share together. We'll be meeting at 6 o'clock, and we'll have food together, and I'll have a short program uh, that we'll all have some time to enjoy some things and learn some things at the same time and finish up in time for choir at 7. Let me mention a couple big things that are coming up on Palm Sunday. Uh, it'll be the baby shower uh, for Madison and Tyler Leopard as they will be welcoming uh, their son into the world sometime uh, in April. And so the baby shower, as you see the information here, there is one thing we need to change on there. So they are registered at baby list, not baby registry. So um, I'll make sure we have that correction in the uh, Chronicle this next week. 
So please make that note. And also later that day, uh, we'll be having the children's Easter egg hunt um, at 5 o'clock, and we'll have more details about that um, next week. Finally, I mentioned to you that um, if you would like to order Easter lilies um, in honor or memory of somebody, please make sure you use the form, the insert um, in your worship guide and fill that out and turn that in. That needs to be turned in also by Palm Sunday the 24th. I think that's about it. Let's center ourselves, take a deep breath. And listen as the choir leads us into worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for blessing us to be able to come into your house and worship you. We thank you for meeting us here when we got here. And we pray that what we do here today will be pleasing to you and will bring glory to your name. Be with us for the remainder of this service. Be with Pastor Tim as he brings the word to us and as we sing songs to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together as we sing hymn 314, I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. Let's stand together and sing.
I'll be reading from Mark 11, 15 through 18. When Jesus reached Jerusalem, he entered the temple area. He began chasing out those who were buying and selling there. He turned over the tables of the people who were exchanging money. He also turned over the benches of those who were selling doves. He would not allow anyone to carry items for sale through the temple courtyards. Then he taught them. He told them, It is written that the Lord said, My house will be called the house where people from all nations can pray. But you have made it a den for robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard about this. They began looking for a way to kill Jesus. They were afraid of him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teachings. Let us pray together. O oh Lord, as we hear this story of Jesus entering into the temple, we confess, O oh God, that too often we have made religion a club for ourselves. We know that in ways that we think about our faith, we oftentimes think of our faith in ways that makes it easy for us and harder for people who maybe don't have as much money or as opportunity as we do. Forgive us, O oh God for making our faith strengthened around material gain, but we shy from following you by carrying a cross and making changes to this world, to our society, which will cost us. Forgive us for being like the money changers in the temple who want a religion that's good for them, but not good for everybody. Open our hearts to Jesus as he makes this journey to Jerusalem and calls us to carry our cross daily with him. Inspire us to draw to a faith that would call us to sacrifice to make this world, this world that you love, a better place for Jesus. In Christ we pray. Amen. Hear these words from the psalmist. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his own sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Will you join me in our short response? Friends, believe the good news of God. In Jesus Christ, we are made whole. Will you join me in prayer again? Oh God, as we enter into this time of prayer, in the midst of this Lenten season, in the midst of spring, we are aware of the changing season. We see the candles being extinguished one week after another, and we know we are getting closer to Jerusalem, closer to Good Friday. And we look around our yards and see the daffodils that are up, the blossoms on the tulip trees and the Bradford pears and the yellow bells that are already sprinkling the lawns and yards around our community. We are on the way to spring, but we are not there yet. Oh God, we Admit that we are impatient people and it is hard when we see things that we like coming our way to be patient for them. And yet we cannot speed up these days to spring any more than we can stop time. We ask, O oh God, that in this Lenten reflection season that we live in the moments of these stories of how Jesus 
made sacrifices in his ministry of serving others and how he calls us into a faith that is lived for others. Oh God, we lift up the heartache that we see around the world that continues to break our hearts, all that is going on in Israel and Gaza for those families who are still missing their loved ones, having been taken hostage for the children and for the innocent people in Gaza who have lost all their homes if it's been obliterated as children are now starving. We ask that somehow your, your peace, your love would intersect here. And we pray for the leaders of our nation and for Israel and for other nations to help alleviate the suffering of the people there. We read the stories that are happening in the Ukraine and our hearts break for those people who have fought for their freedom for the past two years. We ask, O oh God, again, that you as the Prince of Peace would work your way there. Dear so God, we keep in mind those in our church family that are hurting and recovering and needing your care. We pray for Cheryl Pearson in the loss of her partner, Carl, a couple of days ago, and that in her grieving heart, that you'll be with her and surround her with your love and help us as a congregation to reach out to her. We keep in mind Sue Honeycutt and Katie Ward who have both lost their husbands in the last couple of weeks. Walk with them as a good shepherd through these valleys of the shadow of death, again to green pastures and to still waters. For those who have been receiving treatments for cancer, we ask that your continued grace be with them, and in particular we think of Russell and pray for him as he's begun a new treatment for his cancer. And we pray that in the time that he'll be taking this, that it will do exactly what it's supposed to do and keep his cancer from returning. Surround all these persons that we know and love with your grace, that in every step of their walk with their health, they will sense your spirit with them. All these things, O oh God, we lift up in prayer to you. Help us to know that in praying to you and listening to you, that you give us life anew again. So that when we leave this place of worship, we will know that we are loved and we will be inspired to follow you. In Christ Jesus we pray, amen. Let us continue worshiping by singing hymn 223, Nothing But the Blood. Let's stand together and sing.
You may be seated. Good. It's good to see you all. I've got some questions for you all today, and I want to see if you can tell me some things. I want to know who cooks for you at your house. Yes, Josh. Your mommy does? Yeah. Who else? Anybody else? What about your house? Rivers, who cooks for you at your house? Your dad cooks for you at your house? Yeah, yeah. Who, who tucks you in at night? Yeah, Lennon. Your daddy tucks you in at night? Yeah. Charlotte, who tucks you in at night? Your mommy does. Yeah. Josh, who tucks you in at night? Your mommy does? Yes. Yes. Um, let's see. Who else? I wanted to know, who buys clothes for you? Mommy, Yeah. Your mommy does. Yes, she does. That's right. Josh, what about you? Who buys clothes for you? Come on, I, you can find, your mommy is the one that comes and gets you too, right, Craven? Yes, Lena, who, who buys clothes for you? Your mom buys clothes for you? Charlotte, who's buy, who buys clothes for you? Your mom does, okay. Who drives you to places you have to go, like to dance class or to ball games? Who drives you places? Yeah. Who drives you, Lena? Your mom does? Josh, who drives you? Your mommy does? All right. 
Does anybody have a grandparent that drives them places sometimes? Yeah, anybody have grand? You have a grandparent that drives you some places sometimes? Yeah, you have a grandparent that drives you some places, Rizzers? Okay. Yes, well, well, I got a big question for you. Why do your parents and grandparents do these things for you? Ever think about that? Why do they do them for you? Say that again, Josh. Oh, well, yeah, well, they have to because they are your parents, yes. But I think there's another reason, a deeper reason than that. Why do you think they do all these wonderful things for you? They love you. That's exactly right, Holden. They love you. And we tell people that we love them, and I'm sure your parents and your grandparents and maybe some friends tell you they love you. But what's even bigger is when people show they love you by cooking your food and buying your clothes and taking you places you want to go and tucking you in at night, doing all the things that show they love you. Today I'm going to read a scripture passage in a few minutes, in just a minute, that's going to talk about how God loves us and about how Jesus left the heavens to become with us on earth. And that's one way God shows God's love to us, that God would give everything for us, just as your parents and your grandparents do things to show their love to you. That's how God showed God's love to us. Let's pray together. Dear God, we ask that you would help remind these children and all of us that you love us. You love us more than anything in the world and that you have done everything that we might love you. In Jesus we pray, amen. Thank you, boys and girls. And now that passage from the third chapter of John beginning in the 14th verse. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. May God bless it for our hearing and understanding. Amen.
Jesus meets Nicodemus at night, presumably in the shadows out of the light of the evening moon. No one meets at night in Jesus' day. You have to remember, this is long before electricity. There were no street lights in the towns. Homes were lit by candlelight or oil lamps, or maybe the glow of the fireplace. But the faint light in these homes does not spill out into the city streets. At night, it's dark in Jesus' day. I mean deep in the woods dark. Even in the middle of town, it's dark. Today, a parent might say to a teenager who wants to stay out late, nothing good happens after 2 a.m. In Jesus' day, if parents had clocks to mark the hours of the day, they might have said, nothing good happens after 8 p.m. That was the life then. You lived when it was daylight, and you stayed inside when it was dark. Nicodemus meets Jesus at a time when no one will be out. Nicodemus is a Pharisee, a religious leader who served at the temple's council. They generally did not approve of Jesus' radical new teachings. They didn't want him to change their faith. Nicodemus doesn't want anyone to see him meeting with Jesus. That's why he wants to meet him at night. It would ruin his reputation. So Jesus agrees to meet with him at this prearranged place and a prearranged time. The idea that God loves humanity, that God loves the world, that God loves creation, that God made out of nothing, is baked into the stories of the Bible. The two creation stories, which begin the whole Bible, start off by telling us these depictions of God creating the world by first meticulously crafting out every stage of the process as if God had been an architect or an engineer working with precise care to make sure this is exactly the way God wants it to be. In the second story, God creates the whole animal kingdom by forming them with God's hands, shaping them and then breathing into them to give them life. And then God would have strolls with Eve and Adam in the evening as if they were a family just taking the family pet, the family dog out for a walk together just to be together. These depictions are of an intimate God, a God who loves them like family loves one another. When God is giving the Ten Commandments to Moses, Exodus 34 explains that God, before Moses receives the commandments, that God is a God that's merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for a thousand generations. This phrase that God Keep steadfast love is repeated more times in the Bible than any other single phrase. The book of 1 John defines God as love. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. We love because God first loved us. 
God's love for us is described in countless ways from cover to cover in the Bible. But it is this story of this conversation that Jesus has with Nicodemus late at night in an alley shaded from the light of the moon that captures our memory. For God so loved the world that God gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. All right, I want you all to do something with me. I want you to think about two, no more than three people, two or three people that you know love you or have loved you. Hopefully you also love them back, but you know that they love you. I want you to think of two, not more than three people. And this can be people who are alive and love you now, or maybe somebody in the past, someone who's passed on, but you still know their love was real. All right. Everybody got at least two people in your mind, in your head? All right? Okay. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. I want you to picture the first person. How did this person show you love? What did this person do or does that makes you know this person loves you beyond a shadow of a doubt? What did this person say that made you know you are loved? How did just their being communicate to you that you were loved? Can you think of a moment when you knew, beyond a shadow of a doubt, this person loved you? Can you picture that moment? Now think of the second person you thought of. Can you see their face in your mind with your eyes closed? What did this person do that showed you love, that made you know you are loved? What did this person say to you? How did their their being communicate to you that you are loved. As you picture these people, can you feel that love in your heart, in your soul, in your being? All right, I'll let you open your eyes now. Were you able to, by closing, by, were you visualizing what was a moment when they loved you and you knew it? We all have moments like that, right? When we know this person really loves me as me. Some of us have lived through life where we don't think we're very lovable. But in that moment, you knew you were loved. Yesterday in Charlotte, I celebrated a funeral of a man I had known for several years and whose family was very active in the church I pastored for 20 years. And a few days ago, I met with the family to sit around and just talk about this gentleman and and to prepare for the funeral and in those conversations in meeting with the family several things were said one person said you know he showed his love through his cooking when he made you a meal you knew he had put everything in it so that you would enjoy the meal his granddaughter said 
his granddaughter said that Pop would put love in his corn muffins. And then she looked at her grandmother and said, if, do you know how to put love in corn muffins, Grandma? His younger son talked about, and I should preface this, his younger son has several tattoos uh, and a very long beard. And the person who I did the service for uh, was very prim and proper, clean shaven, would never, ever, ever have a tattoo. In fact, really hates the fact that his son has these. But his son was going to have a, one more tattoo that would commemorate his relationship with his father. And on the day he went to the tattoo artist, he found that his father was already there waiting for him. And he sat there while the tattoo artist put this tattoo on his younger son who was having this tattoo to commemorate his love for his dad. And his dad, who didn't really like these things, sat there right with him. And he said he knew, he always knew his dad loved him, but when he did that, he knew his dad loved him for who he was. They talked about how the family went together on fishing trips and this gentleman loved to fish and he loved to take his family out on the water and when they'd go to vacation to make sure they had a boat and they, he taught his sons to fish. He taught, began teaching his grandchildren how to fish. He made sure his daughters-in-law fished. So it was a family occasion. They have family pictures from these events together and it was not so much about just fishing. It was about being together and they talked about the warmth that they felt at these moments. And his younger son talked about his request for his 18th birthday. The parents would ask their sons from the time they were 16 till sometime in their 20s, what thing did they want to celebrate to signify this big birthday? And uh, his younger son wanted to go skydiving on his 18th birthday. <laughs> and so his dad said, this is going to scare me to death but I'm going to do it with you. All these stories about showing love. I never forget a turning point in my life as a, a young adolescent, as a young teenager. Um, I had a cousin who had been taking up golf and had was really golfing for two or three years. He was in his early 20s and he was getting pretty good and he heard that my dad had once been a good golfer. I did not know this. Because ever since I was a kid, my dad never went golfing. But my great aunt had been the West Virginia women's champion golfer for a couple of years. And she had taught my dad how to golf. And he was an excellent golfer. So my cousin challenged him. He said, I know. I've been playing, so I want to play you and beat you. Because everybody in the family says you are the best golfer that ever been in the family. So my dad said, sure, and his clubs were down the basement. I had seen them growing up, and I went into the darkness of the basement, but they were covered over by cobwebs. My dad asked if I would clean the golf clubs, and if I'd clean them all up, he would take me along as well. So we go out. I didn't know anything about golf. Who knows how many uh, times I hacked at the ball, but in watching my dad play my cousin, who was quite verbal about how good he was. And then my dad beating by half a dozen strokes. I was like amazed. My dad is really good athletically. Like I had no idea about this. And so afterwards, I talked to my dad and I said, well, daddy, I said, if you're so good, why aren't you out golfing with people and, you know, showing people how good you are? He said, well, when you were born, it was just more important to be home with you and your mom. And then when your brothers came, I just stopped completely. Because you were more important than a silly game. And you were even more important to me than my friends. And that forever changed my relationship with my dad. That as a young teenager who thinks athletics are so important, my dad had given this up for me. completely changed 
how I understood him for the rest of his life and really for the rest of my life. The story of love in the Bible is always about how God shows love to us. This is what Nicodemus, Jesus was telling Nicodemus even before he said a word. Jesus was the teacher. Jesus was the man Nicodemus wanted to see. And Jesus wasn't the one asking to see Nicodemus. You know, usually when somebody asks to see somebody important, somebody they want to learn something from them, they ask them, well, when is a convenient time for me to meet you? Would you meet me? If I want to meet one of you all, as I have done, some of you know, I will call and see, set up a meeting. And my first question is, when is a convenient time for you? What time of day works for you? What place would you like to meet? You let me know, and I'll somehow work it out. But Nicodemus does the opposite. He says to Jesus, could we meet so nobody knows I'm with you? At night, when nobody else is out. At a place, nobody will see us. Rather than be offended or tell Nicodemus, this is not convenient or this is not safe. Jesus says, yes. And he meets Nicodemus where Nicodemus wants to meet Jesus. Jesus shows him consideration and compassion and generosity and love. Even before Jesus says a word about love. Then as the conversation develops, Jesus came to the point of the climax of the story and declares, for God so loved the world that God gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Of course, the point of the story is that Jesus is the one that God sends. God sent Jesus, his closest relation, the one who is part of God, who is God. God sent his closest love to earth to be God's ambassador. God wanted to become like us, to love us so that we could then love God. And Jesus was the one to do it. You know, by the second century, a common saying among Christians developed it. And if you go back in the history books, you can see this said or written in several different ways. But the gist is this. Jesus became like us so that we might become like Christ. You have heard me say this. It's a phrase I love to repeat because it talks about, it's the foundational statement about God's love for us, about God's love for the world. God could have remained safely in the heavens above or wherever the heavens are, if it's some other dimension or invisibly all around, wherever the heavens are. God could have safely stayed there. But God did not play it safe. God became like us. Jesus became like us with human flesh and a body that bleeds and gets hungry and sleepy. God so loved us that God wanted to know what it was like to be human, to be mortal, to be limited to one place at one time. Jesus left mortality to become mortal like us. Jesus left all of that to show us the way, the way to become like him. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but may have eternal life. Jesus said this to Nicodemus. A religious leader who had been skeptical of Jesus' teachings, his movements that was going to radically change his faith. Jesus tells him simply, this is about love. 
Whatever else you think I'm saying, whatever else you think God is about, it is about love. About God giving up everything to become like us. Later in John's gospel, Jesus tells his disciples, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for your friends. The story of Christmas is about this love about Jesus coming into the world to be like us. And this Lenten journey where we are extinguishing candle lights because Jesus is getting closer and closer to Good Friday, it is also about love, about how Jesus himself in this earthly plane will give up his life for his friends, showing love by serving us. It's as simple as what our children said a few moments ago, who cooks for them, cares for them, tucks them in at night? Why do they do this? Because of love. This is what God does for us. God gives up everything for us, hoping that we may return that love back to God. We love because God first loved us. Friends, all of the Bible, from cover to cover, tells this story. God loves us, period. If you could picture those persons I had you imagine earlier, all the ways they showed you love, They were showing you God's love as well. Because God has given you every person that has loved you. And that love first came from God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. That Jesus became like us so that we might become like Christ. God loves us in order that we might have eternal life and love God for all eternity. Believe this, and you will live. Amen. We conclude our worship service by singing the hymn 254, Were You There? And we invite you, if you've never made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ, you've never had a sense of God's love for you in your life, but this is the day you want to say, I do love God, and I want to follow Jesus. I'll be by the communion table, and we'll be glad to welcome you into this church family and to baptize you into this faith. Let's stand together and sing.
Well, I hope this has been a good day, beginning to your day, a good stopping point as we are in the midpoint of this season of Lent. Do want to take time to thank some people who made this happen today. We are very appreciative, of Amy, for you stepping in to lead us in music. Amy will be doing this for a couple of Sundays uh, this month. Um, next week, Katie is going to be helping us lead in music, and we're thankful for you, Katie, for sharing your gifts for this congregation. Um, do also really appreciate Ashley. Thank you for leading us into reflection of this Lenten season. And uh, please tell Rivers we thanked her for extinguishing the next candle in line. So thank you for that. Um, Lewis, it's good to see you back. Now, I've been gone a couple of weeks. Maybe you were back here last week, but it is good to have you back with worship. And we are so thankful that you are here with us. So good to have you with us so much. Glenn, thank you for leading us um, in invocation. And let's see, is that all my thank yous? I think it is. Um, I have one big thank you, and Janine, I'm going to ask you to come forward. I was not here. I missed Janine's last official week as being our interim music director. So um, I wanted to make sure that um, we took a moment to celebrate all her work with us for these past 18 months? Maybe more than 18? 18. 18 months. 18 months. That's right. So uh, I talked to some choir members and tried to get some feedback and uh, talked to a couple uh, movers and shakers in the church. So um, we know that we stole you away from David a lot of time and that many weekends when you all wanted to do things and go places, you were here because every single week you let us up music. So we want to give you some time for you all to have some time together. So we have in this envelope. I have a gift certificate to one of my favorite restaurants in Charlotte, uh, Mama Ricotta's. If any of y'all have been there, if you like Italian, it's a great restaurant. So we've given you plenty of money for that. We've given you cash in here because you've got to put gas in your car to drive to Charlotte. And you're going to need to pay for parking uptown. Now, Mama Ricotta's does not need to pay for parking. But to go uptown, you've got to pay for parking. And after dinner, you're going to go to, to the Broadway musical Mamma Mia in June. So, um, I thought maybe if you put that far enough away, you and David could move whatever you got planned so that you can make sure that you can have the evening out. And, um, and if you want to go to Mama Ricotta's before that, you can do that. You don't have to do it all one night. But um, anyways, it's your, it's your choice. We want you all to have time because we've taken so much of your time. So, Janine, I'm especially appreciative because when I came on board, you were already the interim music director. And all the times I would have messed up, you kept me from messing up. Not all the time. I've still messed up sometimes anyways. But you saved me from a lot of big mess-ups. So I, I generally appreciate that. And thank you so much for leading this congregation. You all, let's thank you. And as Janine said, she's not going anywhere. She's still going to be here. And she's got her choir robe on to sing. And every now and then, she'll also be leading music, but uh, only occasionally. So we thank you so much. Do you want to say anything? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, choir, for being so wonderful. Um, thank you, Amy, for helping out while we're, we're still figuring all this out. Um, it, was a, it was a blessing for me to do this. It was a privilege for me to serve this church and to serve this family. And I love all of you very much. Thank you for all your support. Now, I'm wondering how mad Janine's going to be mad at me because I know she didn't want me to do that in front of everybody. But anyways, that's just the cost of things. Let's, uh, let's read the benediction. Friends, as you go back out into the world, love God who loved you before you were ever thought of. At the creation of the world, God loved you. So love God with your whole being. And friends, Love your neighbors as yourself, which means to love yourself. Treat yourself well. And friends, love your enemies so that maybe they can become your friends and we can transform the world. And as you go back out into the world, remember that God, the creator who made this universe, has already paved a way for you this week and already goes before you in whatever you do. And Jesus the Christ walks beside of you through everything you're walking through. And the love of God, God's Spirit swirls around you and will protect you and guide you through all the things you're going through. 
So friends, go in peace. Amen.